Hi everyone, I'm Radoslav and today I'm going to be explaining binary game, which was a problem from the lunchtime, which happened a couple of days ago. So yeah, the problem was medium hard. I think it was the hard, the second hardest one. And the main idea was to do a, an, a, basically like it was an ad hoc problem. And you could also say that it required binary search, but in general, the main thing is basically that it's ad hoc. And yeah, basically, I'm going to explain the solution. I'm first going to start with the problem st statement, and after that, I'm basically just going to explain the two main parts of the problem. Okay, so let's just open the problem statement. And yeah, it is actually like relatively simple. Basically, you are given n integers. Actually, not n integers, but like you are given 16 n integers. So, like, you have quite a lot of integers. And they yet yeah, and they're given like by AI A1 until A sixty nine. So basically you want to rearrange them, so in other words, shuffle them, so that X and Y, which are given in the way described here, are in a way like, like the difference between X and Y is as large as possible. So in other words, you want to fix a specific value for X and the specific value for Y, and you want to ma maximize their difference. So like X minus Y. Uh, so yeah, I mean, basically what those expressions actually mean, in a way, you basically have 16 n integers and you split those integers into two parts. The first part is for X and the second part is for Y. And both parts actually will have uh, eight n integers because yeah, 16 over two is eight. And those expressions basically have clauses where the clauses is like just one pair of two numbers which are bracketed. And inside of them, they actually have a XOR, where XOR is like the bitwise exclusive OR, which is like a pretty well-known operator. If you don't know what this means, uh, pause the video and check it out. So also you're given this other operator, which is an AND. So, and yeah, in other words, what you do is like, you basically do the AND of the XORs of every pair. In other words, it's like very similar to a CNF. Uh, so in a way, like it's a conjunction, but like, this time it's in the inner clauses, you don't really have uh, disjunctions, you actually have like XOR instead of an R. But yeah, but basically like you kind of have a lot of XORs and on top of that you get their end. And yeah, I mean every number should be in exactly one pair and also uh, the number of clauses on top and on bottom should be exactly 4N because on top we have 8N eight, eight numbers so and every clause has exactly two numbers so there are 4N clauses in both the expressions. So, uh, this is pretty much the problem and you want to optimize the value of X minus Y. And it seems like quite complicated in the beginning, uh, but it actually turns out that there's a relatively simple solution to it. So yeah, the constraints are that N is like up to 10,000, but this, this actually means that uh, you actually have like around 160,000 numbers because you have 16 n numbers. You shouldn't forget that. Uh, so no quadratic solution will pass. So in a way, like if you need to think of something which is n log or yeah. And also like all numbers are up to 10 to the nine. And there was like just one subtask, uh, which was like just with the original constraints. So yeah, let, let's go straight to the solution. And as you can see from my notes, I kind of base the solution on two parts. The first part being how to actually minimize y and how to maximize x, which is like the second part. And basically, uh, we're doing this mostly because in a way, if you want to maximize the difference, you kind of want to have a very small y and a very large x. And now we're going to see that if we, if you, we kind of split the problem into like first minimizing y and maximizing x, we actually get uh, something pretty nice. So, okay, we're going to start with minimizing y. And basically what we are going to do, let, let's consider a larger n, let's say n equal to 8, because 8 is like, I mean, it's not very, uh, it's not very large, but it's also like uh, not very small. Because, yeah, it's larger than, you're going to see why we're considering n equal to 8 in a bit. So, also, let, let's... We have like 16n numbers, so let's just pick an arbitrary uh, set of 8n numbers from the initial ones. Also, like we can actually choose any set of 
eight n numbers, but let's just for the sake of it uh, consider that they're from the initial ones. It's like a subset of the initial ones. And now we are gonna show that actually we can always rearrange those numbers so that uh, their score, by score I mean this expression I talked about, which, like, which we basically want to calculate, uh, can be equal to zero. So in a way, like we can rearrange those eight n numbers and pair them in like the groups so that their score will actually be zero. And this is pretty neat because this means that uh, whatever the choice for y is, we can always fix it to be equal to zero. Uh, of course, if n is greater than eight. So intuitively, let's try building the y value from top. So like from the largest bit. And yeah, I mean, I'm going to basically prove this thing by considering the first three numbers. You can actually consider an arbitrary set of three numbers from the a10 and uh, based like the topmost bit. So now the main observation here is that because of the pigeonhole principle, we have two bits from those three numbers. Well, like, let's look at the top bits of those three numbers, like they're ar arbitrary three numbers. We know that we have like three numbers. So there are definitely at least two of them, which, which have like a common bit. I mean, like, like which either, which have like the same topmost bit. This is like just basically the pigeonhole principle. And when they have the topmost bit equal, this means that when you XOR those two numbers, their topmost bit will actually be, z be equal to zero. Because uh, if you have the topmost bit uh, equal, then when you XOR those two numbers, uh, this bit will be basically equal. So this means that if we just consider any three numbers and group them together, uh, basically what will happen is that the topmost bit will already be zero. So we can kind of like just forget about it. I mean, the topmost bit in Y will be zero. So we can kind of forget about it. So in our words, like if right now we have an instance with a 10 numbers and the topmost bit was K, we kind of reduce this to a 10 minus two numbers and K minus one, because like we kind of reduce the topmost bit and we just like, we chose three numbers, but we are only using two of them. So like we chose, we choose like those two, two numbers, we each have like the same bit. We group them together in the XOR, uh, which ensures the topmost bit will become zero. And after that, we, we are going to have like one of the three numbers left. And what we are going to do with it, we are just going to literally put it again in the uh, group and like continue with the next three numbers. So yeah, we are still going to use this number. So that's why we just reduce with two numbers. And yeah, I mean, this way we kind of like reduce our instance. And I mean, obviously you have a finite number of bits in Y, which can be zero or like one. So in a way, at some point, this k minus one will become zero because you know you can basically just recursively repeat this procedure, and we can notice uh, that if at some point k becomes zero, but like we still have some number of uh, numbers, or in other words, like if uh, the first term is positive but like the second term becomes zero at some point, this means that we can surely create y equal to zero, and here we should notice that all numbers were less than 10 to the 9, which means that uh, k, which is the topmost bit, is definitely less than 30, because 2 to the 30th is actually greater than 10 to the 9. So this means that k is definitely less than 30. So if we just take n equal to 8, we're going to notice that uh, the number of steps for n to become 0 is actually 32, which is definitely greater than k, which is like less than 30. So this actually just proves that if n is greater than or equal than eight, we are certainly going to have, um, we are certainly going to, there's like certainly an algorithm that makes y equal to zero. But yeah, I mean, this works for eight n greater or equal than eight. And it actually turns out that this is also true for smaller values of n. Oh, and more precisely for any n that's greater than two, you can actually prove that y can always be a zero. And I decided to not present this proof in the editorial because it's kind of based on just approximating some counts and it's not so much based on intuition. Well, this simple proof with like pigeonhole principle is quite nice and you can easily just uh, 
find it out. And I mean, like when you actually see that for almost any value, like greater than eight, you can always make y equal to zero. This kind of suggests that this will also be true for smaller values of uh, y, uh, for smaller values of n. And yeah, I mean, you know, I, I feel like this, this idea is quite uh, easy to get to. And after that, you can kind of like just notice that y will always be uh, zero, unless n is equal to one, which is actually a special case, but I'm going to talk about this later on in the solution. And yeah, I mean, basically, like if you're interested in the proof, you can check out the, uh, uh, like the main editorial, like the text format, because I feel like when it's about like just counting things, it's not very nicely presented in the video. And yeah, most likely it will be easier for you to just like look at the formulas and to see how the proof goes. But yeah, basically, in a way, you find the number of subsets with, so, with like the result y being non equal to zero, and you kind of see that this count is always uh, smaller than the actual number of uh, permutations. And this means that you're definitely going to have at least one permutation with uh, y equal to zero. But yeah, I mean, this is like the other proof. And this means that if we can almost always, just for now, let's assume that n is greater than or equal to 10 2. And this means that whatever the choice, uh, I mean, in a way, like, like we can just forget about y because like the smallest value we can get is obviously zero because it's going to be positive, greater or equal than zero. So like non-negative and yeah, in a way, we just proved that for almost all values uh, of n, you can always choose y equal to zero. So basically the problem is kind of reduced to just maximizing x, unless n is equal to one, which again, as I said, is a special case, which we're gonna later on handle. So yeah, I mean, basically right now our problem just became to maximize x. And yeah, actually maximizing x is way simpler than this problem. And I would say this, like if the problem was just given to maximize x, quite a lot of people would have gotten it because it's like a quite standard technique with binary search. And what what you basically do is, uh, let's actually first consider the topmost bit of X and try setting it to one. So you can notice that this is only possible if they're like initially, again, we don't really care about the Y, so we can uh, just choose eight N numbers for X and just leave everything else for Y. So in other words, we just need to see whether we can choose some eight n numbers and rearrange them in a particular order so that we maximize x. And then like, we're just gonna have like some numbers which are left out and we are gonna form y equal to zero using them. So yeah, I mean, basically the main idea here is that uh, we are, it's quite standard, like for the topmost bit of x, at least for the topmost bit of x, you basically like, when can we have the topmost bit equal to one? Well, this means that in all clauses, because I mean, we have, we basically have like four n clauses and in every clause, we want the topmost bit to be different. So one of the numbers in the topmost clause will have the topmost bit equal to zero. The other one will have it equal to one. And this means that you need at least four n numbers that have the topmost bit equal to zero and at least four n numbers that have the topmost bit equal to one. And if this isn't true, we can never have the topmost bit equal to one. So, I mean, basically like this way, you can kind of check the topmost bit. If you can set it to, z to one, you're definitely going to set it to one because uh, the number is binary. So the sum of all other bits is definitely smaller than the topmost bit. So in other words, you can really start from the topmost bit, try setting it to one. If this is possible, you set it to one and continue with some more constraints for the other bits. If you can't, you just leave it as zero and try setting the next bit to one and so on. And this way, like with logarithmic, I mean, this is like just a quite, quite standard technique with binary search. And yeah, I mean, now basically we need to kind of figure out because this is just for the topmost bit. And now we kind of have some dependencies, like say that the topmost bit was able to be one. Now we kind of have some dependencies for the other bits. Like the sec, if we want like the, second largest bit to be one, we kind of have the dependency that we don't really want to break the topmost being one. And yeah, it's actually quite simple to generalize this observation uh, to just like any bit. So 
let's say that right now we are looking at the topmost k bits and the value let let the value like we want to have for the topmost k bits be v and basically you can notice that we can just skip all bits in v that are set to zero so in other words like if we have some zero in v we don't really care about this bit in any of the numbers because we have already decided that this bit will be zero like in the previous iterations of the binary search so what we can do is basically just consider uh, the bits that are one and you can notice that in a way we can have like uh, we can only group contrasting groups of bits so in other words like if the non-zero bits of v uh, are like basically like we have some positions and we can we are going to determine a group for some number as basically the non-zero bits of v that uh, are in this particular number you know like we look at the topmost k bits and we kind of uh, end them with v like for every number and this way we kind of get the group and now the main observation is that uh, a number can only like, like we are only interested in construct contrasting pairs of groups so in other words like uh, if uh, a, a number is in, in a group X, no, not in a group X, in, if a number is in a group C, then we can only pair it with numbers that are in a group 6 or V. And yeah, I mean, this way you can literally just count the number of numbers in every group. And yeah, you can obviously like, if you can, I mean, in a way like, like you kind of create uh, pairs of groups and you just like look at the smaller count in every group sum the counts and check whether like this sum of counts is less than 4n or greater or equal than 4n because i mean the, the depending on whether this total number of possible pairs is greater or equal than 4n this kind of de determines the number of clauses we can make and yeah if we can make enough clauses we can definitely set the top k bits to be equal to v and hence we are kind of done i mean Maybe it's kind of complicated if you haven't seen problems like that before, but in general it's quite standard and you can look at some of the accepted implementation and it's going to be like quite easy to understand what I meant by this. But yeah, it's like a quite common approach when you're trying to binary search things. But yeah, I mean, basically this means that with a quite simple binary search, we can actually find the maximum value of X in like n log time. And also like multiply by 16 because we should notice that we actually have quite a lot of numbers so the constant here isn't like very small but still yeah i mean this is like fast enough to actually find the maximum possible value for x and yeah i mean we're actually done with the solution because uh we already figure out why is always equal to zero i mean at least for n greater or equal than two we don't really care uh what numbers are left for y because we can always rearrange them so that y becomes zero and this means that we can literally just use this greedy to actually find not not greedy but like the binary search which i explained to basically just find the maximum possible value of x and the answer will be equal to this because x minus zero minus y will be equal just to x because y is zero but yeah i mean this is pretty much the full solution and yeah uh, it's quite simple but we should also notice that we have this corner case for n equal to one, in which case we actually need to write a brute force. But I mean, we just have 16 numbers. So, I mean, even a brute force, which is uh, with complexity, I mean, basically like the, I, I guess the neatest way to do this would be with like uh, backtracking or like some other brute force, possibly like just iterating through all masks. But also another way is to basically just do a DP with bit masks. You kind of have like the XOR, uh, the current end um, of like the first group and the current end of the second group and uh, a bit mask, bit mask of the used numbers. And this way you basically can solve the problem faster to be fair. Uh, I mean, not faster, but like this is another way to solve it for n equal to one. But yeah, I mean, for n equal to 1, you literally just need to have some brute force that just solves the problem. Because our assumption, I mean, our assumption for y greater or equal than, uh, for our assumption for y always being equal to 0 kind of breaks for uh, n equal to 1. So we still need to solve this problem. 
So we kind of have like this brute force. And yeah, this is something you could miss while writing up your solution. So it's good to note it. But it, for the larger values, it's literally just finding the maximum value of x and outputting it. So yeah, this is pretty much the whole solution. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this quite short editorial. But yeah, I mean, the problem is kind of complicated and you can't really explain partial solutions because there is just one subtask. subtask. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed and thanks for watching. And I guess see you next time.